everyone else. We will be today in Galatians chapter 5. If you want to turn there in your physical Bible today, sticking in one place today, mostly Galatians chapter 5. So as most of you know, and as I mentioned before, over the last month or so, we've been teaching about the Holy Spirit and all the things that the New Testament has to say about what in the world we are supposed to expect from the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God. How are we supposed to interpret what the Holy Spirit of God does in us and through us? What are we to expect from all of this? That's what we've been covering in this series that we call Filled. And hopefully through it, you've been able to think through these things a little bit biblically to understand what is the expectation of the Holy Spirit as presented in the New Testament in Scripture. Now, that being said, I know because it's summer, a lot of people have had to miss different weeks, and that's totally understandable, but I would highly, highly encourage you to go back and listen to those sessions to really get a full grasp of all that the Holy Spirit is and all that he does for believers, because we've covered a lot of ground here. The first week, we covered Jesus' explanation of the Holy Spirit, as he says in John chapter 14, as well as the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Now, both of those passages highlighted the Holy Spirit as God, as part of the Trinity, working within those believers and trusting in Christ for God's promises, working for God's glory. That's what the Holy Spirit has been for. We then looked at some of sort of what we would call the inner work of the Holy Spirit. Relying mostly on the book of Romans and some other passages, we saw that the Holy Spirit does miraculous work inside the hearts of believers, that he facilitates at our salvation, he facilitates our regeneration, that in him we are made new creations. And not only that, but he facilitates our sanctification, which we'll talk a little bit more about today. And then in addition to that, we talked about the Holy Spirit's role in teaching us, in renewing our minds, in bringing to our remembrance the things that Jesus has said. That's the inner work that the Holy Spirit does for us. And then over the last two weeks, we talked about some of the outer results of the Holy Spirit. We talked about spiritual gifts, that confusing thing that we read about in the Bible sometimes of the Holy Spirit giving people supernatural abilities and things that they can do that are not of themselves for God's glory. We talked a great deal that, that first week of those two sessions about what spiritual gifts are for. What are they meant to achieve for the fact that they are for the common good and for the glory of God being shown through the church. And then last week we talked about some of those spiritual gifts specifically. Things even like the weird stuff like prophecy and tongues and healings. We talked about those things and whether or not it is right and good for us to believe in those things continuing in the church today. So like I said, I encourage you, if you miss any of those things, go back and listen because there's been a lot of ground covered in what the Holy Spirit is all about. And all that we have learned together about the Holy Spirit from the scriptures has been fairly heavy and a little bit difficult to chew on. But in all of this teaching about the Holy Spirit, we would be mistaken if we missed what is probably the clearest and most straightforward explanation of what the Holy Spirit does in our day-to-day -day lives. How are we to interact with the Holy Spirit? How do we expect the, the Holy Spirit to do things through us in just normal living? And that passage comes here in Galatians 5. Galatians 5 gives us somewhat of a plain understanding of what it means to actually live as people who know and rely upon the Holy Spirit of God. And as we begin to examine this beautiful passage today, I want you to keep in mind a very simple illustration, a three-legged race. You guys ever been subjected to one of these things before, perhaps at a family picnic or at a kid's camp of some sort? Maybe you've had to do this. It's a very simple thing. All you do is tie one of your legs to the legs of another person really tight, the tighter the better, and then you're supposed to race from one place to another with working together somehow. And as you know, what typically happens in this case is that someone's going to end up on the ground, right? Why do you think that is? It's because we don't always run the same way. Someone doesn't know which foot is supposed to go first, or you even change your step in a natural way to you that's not natural to the other person, and people end up on the ground. Someone usually ends up just being dragged across the finish line, right? Keep this illustration in mind because sometimes in a three-legged race, you'll see an example of a pair of people who are mentally in sync. They are unified. They know what they're doing, and they are able to move at an impressive pace. It's rare, but it can be done. And as you'll see in Galatians today, that is how we are meant to live with the Holy Spirit. 
In fact, if you're looking at Galatians 5 in your Bible, you'll see a heading over this section that says, Keep in step with the Spirit. As people who are saved by our faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, we are given this powerful, personal presence of God in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells us. It is part of who we are. And while we may experience independence, that we are making choices in our daily actions and decisions, the goal is to be, as it says, in step with the Spirit. Like a really skilled three-legged race, there ought to be unity and cooperation between us and God's Spirit. When it comes to the living in the Spirit, we should strive to be synchronized, not simply dragged along on the ground behind what God wants. So as we conclude our series on the Holy Spirit today, let's take a look together at Galatians chapter 5 and consider what it means to keep in step with the Spirit. We opened our service today with some really important verses that lead up to this. Paul is writing to a group of believers, a church, in a place called Galatia, and what he is writing to them is really important because he says that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And this understanding of freedom is fundamentally important for what he is about to say next. They may have understood freedom to mean, I can do whatever I want. I can make whatever choices I want. If I'm saved by the grace of Jesus, then I can go on living and do whatever I want to do in my life. But that is not freedom. Paul is leading them to understand that they are called to a higher kind of freedom, a different kind of freedom. A freedom not to live in opposition to God but the freedom to live, to live as God created them to be. This is a higher and better freedom. It isn't the freedom to do whatever they want with no consequences. No, this is the freedom to live in step with the Spirit, to live as God intended for them to live, to live free from the curse and the burden of the sin that has lied to us for so long. Because the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see the reality of our sin, and the death that goes along with it, we should long to live in freedom and in step with the Spirit. So this is what Paul says. Look with me in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 17. Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now, you'll see in this passage as we go along this comparison of the individual will, meaning the flesh, and then the Spirit on the other side, bound together in this sort of three-legged race. But in this race, we should understand that we are not just out of step with the Spirit— we are running in an opposite direction. We, in our sinful flesh, completely misunderstand what the race is even for. So when the gun goes off and it's time to run, the Holy Spirit is going this way, and our flesh is leading us to go the opposite way. We are regenerated and made new creations by the Holy Spirit at the moment of our salvation. We've talked about that before. But at the same time, we experience what is called sanctification, meaning that we are being led and changed into the image of Christ day by day by the work of the Holy Spirit. He is going one direction. We in our flesh want to go the other, but sanctification is, is the process of growing to understand what it means to be in step and going the right direction with the Spirit of God. And here, Paul describes this tension. So Paul describes the Spirit as being against our flesh, and our flesh is against the Spirit. He says that they are opposed to one another. So the first blank on your sheet, I think, I think a basic understanding for us this morning is this, that believers in Christ live with two opposing desires, the flesh and the spirit. There are these two differing forces at work within us. They are in opposition to one another. That means that they don't just differ slightly. They are actually diametrically opposed to one another. They are opposites. And that opposition boils down to one thing, as the verse says. It is our desires. As Paul said, if we walk by the Spirit, then we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The desire of the flesh 
meaning our sinful nature, is opposed to the will and the desire of the Spirit. When we do gratify those desires, then we can know and understand that we are then out of step with the Spirit, stumbling through the spiritual three-legged race, unable to function and move as we are meant to. The desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and vice versa. We should understand this. In fact, as Paul said, the Spirit will keep you from doing the things that you want to do. Meditate on that passage for a second. The Spirit of God will prevent you from doing things that you want to do. Take a moment to understand how absolutely countercultural that statement is. The message of our sinful world in which we live is that we should pursue our desires above all else. The message of our sinful world all the time is, if you want it in your heart, that's what you should go after. You pursue what is best for you. Live your best life. Don't have any apologies. You want what you want, and you pursue what you want most. The desire of your flesh is the greatest good. That's what our world tells us all the time. But right here, we are told this message of the truth of the gospel is the Spirit of God actually prevents you from doing what you want. That's not what people want to hear, is it? That's not the popular message. But the mature Christian, the one who is regenerated and made new by the Spirit, the one who is being sanctified by Him, understands that this is not God stifling and shutting down anything within us that is good. No, we understand this as protective guardrails from God, that it is God doing something better for us. We understand because the Holy Spirit has opened our eyes to the reality of our sin, that the only thing God is ever doing by stopping us from doing what we want, the only thing that he's doing is protecting us, that it is for our good. It is only God leading us away from the slavery of our sin because, as Paul already said, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So do not submit yourself again to a yoke of slavery. God is opposed to sin. He is at odds with our spirit, with our sinful nature. And it should become the joy of the Christian to put our sin to death, even though we know there is a part of us that still wants that sin. We are to put it to death. In other words, someone who is living in the spirit welcomes the correction and the redirection and even the absolute interference of God to stop us from doing the sinful things that we want to do in our hearts. This comes from the basic knowledge that the Holy Spirit has shown us that our sin leads to death. So when we read that the Spirit of God prevents us from doing what we want to do, that is our joy. Praise God that he rescues me from the death of my sin. And Paul goes on to say this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. He says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If we are in step with the Spirit of God, Paul notes that we are not under the law. So what does that mean? Well, we should note that Paul here is speaking of God's law, the moral law, not the random and various laws of different nations and countries over time. He's talking about God's basic moral code, the things that he's given to the people, the Ten Commandments and some more things that tell us how to honor God and the way that we should live. That's the law that he's talking about. And Paul says, look, if you are in step with the Spirit, you are not under that law. So here's what that means. There's kind of two layers that we should understand to this statement. The blank on your sheet puts it like this. Keeping in step with the Spirit means doing what is right because we desire what is right. This is how we are no longer under the law. We're not just doing what is right. We desire to do what is right. We can understand that the Jews to whom Paul was speaking, mainly Jews that he was speaking to at this time, viewed the law of God, the moral law of God. They viewed that oftentimes as a burden. They were stuck in it. It was a legalistic system with an incredibly high standard for behavior. You must do these things to be right with God. In that way, they were under the law. The law was burdensome. 
there were rules to follow and consequences for not following them. And in that way, the law was a burden, the iron fist of God's judgment always upon them waiting to come down. But what Paul is saying here is that when we are led by the Spirit of God, when we are in step with the Spirit, if we're putting God's desires over our own, then we're simply doing the moral things that God would want us to do. We are in step with the Spirit. We're not being dragged along. We're not trying to go the opposite direction. We're going the way that God would want us to go in this three-legged race. We are doing the law. In step with the Spirit means that you are doing what God has said is right. It's that simple. So in that way, the first layer that we understand not being under the burden of the law is that we're not under the burden of the law because we're just doing what is right. If we're in, the, in step with the Spirit, we are doing what God has said is correct. But the second dimension that connects to what Paul said before is this. If we're led by the Spirit, then we do not see the moral law of God as burdensome, but rather as aspirational and good. In other words, it's what we desire. We are not under the law because in the Spirit, following the law and desires of God is our joy in our hearts as the Holy Spirit sanctifies us, and as we get in step with the Spirit, as Paul says, we are being conformed into the image of Christ, which means our desires are changing. We are transformed into actually wanting to follow God's law. That's the second dimension. We are not under the law because the law is our joy. I want to do what God wants. I'm not just doing it because I'm trying to follow along with the commands and the, the leading of the Spirit. No, I want to do these things. Think of it like this. When you were a child, you fought against bedtime. Bedtime was your enemy. You were under the law of bedtime. Your parents imposed that upon you. You didn't want to do that. You wanted to stay up. You wanted to be wild and crazy. You wanted to see what your parents were watching on TV. You wanted to stay up late just to see what it was like. You wanted to have energy all the time. But your parents knew that it was best for you to go to bed early. Now, if you are like me as an adult, you are no longer under the law of bedtime because bedtime has become your joy, has it not? I love bedtime. I love putting my kids to bed on time, and I love putting myself to bed on time. Bedtime is my joy because when I get enough rest, I feel good. It is good for me. It is my joy to have a bedtime. In fact, most of the actions of my day are leading towards me just getting to that bedtime. I want it. So I don't just do it. I want to do it. That is how I am no longer under the law of bedtime. Right? It is the same thing for a mature Christian. Being led by the Spirit, you're not just doing what is right because you have to. You're doing what is right because you desire to. It is your joy to live under the law of God, so it is not burdensome to you to do so. Now, what Paul's going to do next in this passage is he's going to paint a really vivid picture of these two warring desires that live with each one of us. So he's going to paint a picture of what the following the, the impulses of your flesh is like. And then he's going to paint a picture of what it's like to be in step with the Spirit. And he's going to be very specific and detailed in order not only to highlight the opposition, but also to kind of elicit a, a right response from his readers. So this is how Paul goes on to, uh, to explain it. Look at Galatians 5, verses 19 to 21. He says, Now the works of the flesh are evident sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and, like, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, if you've ever been reading the New Testament before, you'll know that Paul is kind of known for these long lists of sins, these long lists of things that are detestable to God. And I think that he does this for a couple of reasons. First of all, when you read this, you definitely get the sense that because they are so specific, that Paul probably had some specific people in mind in Galatia to whom he was directly speaking. 
So the way that this was worked is that, that Paul would write these letters to these churches, and the pastor of those churches would stand and read this letter to the whole congregation. You can almost imagine when you read this list, the pastor saying, hey guys, we got this letter from Paul. This is what he says. Sexual immorality. He looks and he's like, I think I know who that's about. Um, enmity, division, strife. We see you. Going through the list, he knows exactly who Paul is talking about in all of these things. So I think that's one of the reasons that he gives us these lists. Sometimes it just shows us that these are direct sins that the church was dealing with. But the second reason that I think these long lists of sins are helpful is because it puts on display the comprehensive nature of our sinful desires. If it was just a couple of things, maybe we could handle those things. But this is a long list, and Paul even says, in addition to these things, there's other things like these. It's a long list of ways that we displease God, that when we follow the desire of our flesh, <clears throat> there's a wide variety of ways that we fail, ways that we are in opposition to the Spirit of God. There are many, many ways in which we fail. Think of it like this. If, you, if you've ever had to use, um, if you've ever gone on a diet, you said, okay, I'm going to use a calorie tracking app where you can enter in the food that you eat each day and it tells you how close you are to your caloric goal. If you've ever had to do this, you might get to the end of the day and think, hey, I did a great job today. I think I really ate well. I think I made the right choices. And then you start entering in that food and you're like, whoa, that is that many calories? Whoa, that's, that's that bad? And the number goes up and up and up. And like what you thought had been a good day was actually a day where you were way off target. In the same way, when we read a list of sins like this, we may want to think to ourselves, I'm not like that. I'm pretty good. I don't do those things. But then if you read the list carefully, I think you might see that you do some of those things, that you do desire many of these things. I think when we read a list like this, we should not only see how repulsive of a list of sins that it is, but also how at least some of those things are relatable to us. I may not desire many of those things, but I know a little something about envy. I may not be prone to some of that stuff, but I know a little bit about anger. I may not describe myself as a sorcerer, but I certainly know jealousy. And when it's all laid out there like this in a list, we all ought to be able to visualize and understand these two opposing natures within us and the need that we all have to come into step with the Spirit. Again, Paul is listing these things so that we identify, so that we understand, this is me. This is the, the nature of my sinful flesh. These are the things that are desired. And what does that lead to? He's presenting it in front of us in comparison to the list that comes next. And this list is supposed to look bad. So the next blank on your sheet is this. The desires of the flesh lead to dysfunction and destruction. That is meant to be very clear here. When he lists all these things, they are not listed as things that are good. They're not listed as things that are desirable. Desirable. But these things are bad. They lead to dysfunction and destruction. <clears throat> By the Spirit, we see these things for what they are, which is destructive. Paul lists these destructive sins in several categories that you may notice if you look back at the verse. First of all, Paul starts off the list with a couple of sexual sins. Now, we should understand as modern readers of this text that our world and our culture specifically would like to think that whatever sexual desire you have should be pursued wholeheartedly at all costs. But this shows us that this, any sexual desire outside of God's intended design is in opposition to God's spirit. Any Christians who try to celebrate modern cultural changes to the biblical traditional sexual ethic, they should read this and see clearly and understand they are celebrating something that is in opposition to the Spirit of God. We don't back down on this. We don't change our minds on these things because it is plain and clear in front of us. Paul just said the desires of the flesh are opposed to the work of the Spirit. And here, what is the first thing that he lists out of the gate? Sexual sins. He uses the term sexual immorality, which is sometimes in different translations translated as fornication, which basically just means any sexual activity outside of marriage. 
he lumps in the term impurity to highlight the importance of purity within these sexual relationships. He goes on and uses the word sensuality, which is sometimes translated as debauchery, in order to just simply drive home that this sexual sin can take place even within our minds. It's not just something that we do. It is a comprehensive problem. And over and over and over again in the New Testament, we see sexual sin highlighted as a specifically dangerous category of sin. And here we cannot deny the fact that it's presented to us very plainly these sexual desires outside of God's design are opposed to the Spirit. They are against what the Spirit of God desires. And doing these things and thinking these things and wanting these things, we should understand, is unhealthy. The Spirit of God is opposed to it. These are dysfunctional and destructive things, and they are at odds with the very character of God. But that's not the only thing he lists. He lists a second category. The second category is the religious or a worship-related category. He mentions idolatry and sorcery. And we understand that we don't think of ourselves as idol worshipers today, but that was certainly a major problem at the time, that real, actual, physical idols people would go and worship. And they would do so not, not necessarily because they believed in the idols, but because they really liked the celebration and the things that went along with idol worship. One very common thing that went along with idol worship in this area at this time was prostitution. So he's saying, look, if you're practicing this kind of thing, you're doing something that is wrong, that is dysfunctional, that is opposed to God. And the second term that he used that we don't necessarily use today is sorcery. I wouldn't categorize many of you as sorcerers, I hope. Nobody's practicing witchcraft in your closet at home, I, I would hope, right? However, the word that's translated as sorcery here is the same Greek word from which we get the word pharmaceuticals. It's the same sort of thing. At these idol-worshiping festivals, they would often take different kinds of drugs in order to worship through this kind of ecstatic experience. That also is listed as something that is wrong, that is opposed to God. The desire to do that is definitely what we would still consider idolatry, even if we, we use it by a different name. And we ought to recognize these things as dysfunctional and destructive at odds with the Spirit of God. Thirdly, Paul lists several societal or social kinds of sins. He says enmity, which means hatred. Strife, which is causing fights and provoking violence. He lists jealousy and fits of anger and rivalries and dissensions and divisions, all those things, and envy. And all of these things were obviously and clearly tearing people apart. Those kinds of things are things that tear apart families, that tear apart communities, that tear apart even the church. And we are meant to see that list and say that's dysfunctional, that's destructive. I can see and understand one that is in opposition to the character of God. Finally, Paul lists drunkenness in orgies. And just so you're, you know your kids are safe, it's not in the traditional sense. The word orgies used here is really most likely referring to group drinking binges. In this area, they would have festivals to the god Bacchus, which is the god of wine, and it would just get really crazy with a bunch of people drinking together, and that was often called an orgy. That's what he's talking about here. All these things and things like them, as Paul said, are meant to help us to see the dysfunction and the destruction that are wrought when we are out of step with the Spirit, when we choose our own desires over the desires of the Spirit of God. And all these things, regardless of how much we want them, are opposed to the spirit and the character of God. So that's one picture that Paul paints. And now Paul's gonna paint the second picture. This is what following in step with the spirit looks like. You'll know this verse well, hopefully. Galatians 5, 22 to 23 says this. He says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such things there is no law. We should understand that if living according to our flesh does all of that stuff that we just talked about, then living according to the Spirit should do the opposite. Again, these things are opposed to each other. They are against one another. Living in the Spirit means growing to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Now, be honest with me for just a second. For those of you who were raised in church, when you read that verse, how many of you had the children's song come to mind? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Anybody? Is that just me? My wife. My wife has it too. Sam has it as well. 
That's the kind of thing that comes to mind. We sing these things because these are the desirable things. This is the stuff that we should want. It is the change in our desire that we should start to engage as we walk in step with the Spirit. So the simple thing for us to understand is this. Especially in contrast to the list of sins that Paul has just put out there, we know this. The desires of the Spirit are right and beautiful and good. It is a very clear picture that Paul is painting here. One of these lists is dysfunctional and destructive. The other list is right and beautiful and good. Especially in contrast to the list of the desires of the flesh, these things should seem to us so much more desirable. Anyone with the slightest hint of a conscience or any kind of moral reasoning ought to be able to see the difference. Our one list is dysfunctional and destructive. The other is beautiful and constructive, good for those who desire it and for those around them. Now, it's worth noting that all of these wonderful, beautiful, respectable, and admirable traits are listed in the singular. All of these things are the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits of the Spirit. And the reason I point that out is this. It's not that walking in the Spirit may help you grow in some of these things, you might not grow a little bit of love and a little bit of peace and a little bit of kindness. No, the fruit of the Spirit walking in step with Him is that you receive all of these things. They're not individualized. You should grow in all of these areas. The closer you are in step with the Spirit of God breeds all of these things at once within us. Again, these two desires, these two natures are understood to be opposed to one another. Christians growing in faith and walking in the Spirit are meant to set aside all the dysfunctional and destructive sins listed before, and instead, we should be developing new desires that grow this new kind of fruit in our lives. We leave behind one to gain the other, and it is more than a worthwhile trade. As a Christian, living in the Spirit, these are the changes that you should see. You should understand this to be the opposite of the way you were before. There should be a before you knew Christ, a before you knew the Spirit, and an after. There should be evidence. While the old desire was something like sensuality or impurity, your new desire in the Spirit is love. You should understand yourself to be altogether different because you are in step with the Spirit. Instead of jealousy, you find yourself to be joyful. Instead of dissensions and divisions, you now desire peace. Instead of anger, you should now want patience. Instead of strife, you should begin to see a desire for kindness. Instead of sexual immorality, you should seek goodness. Instead of rivalries, you should want to display faithfulness. Instead of enmity, you should want to grow in gentleness. Instead of drunkenness, idol worship, sorcery, drug use, and all the like, you should desire self-control. So let me be very clear. For those of us who claim to follow Jesus, there should be a significant change in us. There should be a before and an after. Before, you desired sin. But now your desires are falling into step with the Spirit. Now you experience love, joy, peace, patience, all of it. It comes from the Holy Spirit. God is changing you and leading you away from the destruction and dysfunction of your sin before and leading you towards things that are healthy and right and good. Now, Paul concludes this section saying this in verses 24 to 25. He says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So what we see here is very simple. simple. The last blank on your sheet is this, that keeping in step with the Spirit means that we crucify our sinful desires. There should be evidence of our faith. If we believe these things about the Holy Spirit, and we have covered many things that we believe about the Holy Spirit, then we should see those things taking place. If we belong to Christ, and if the Holy Spirit is living within us, then that means that we have put to death the desires of the flesh. Our old nature, our des old desires are dead. They have been crucified with Christ. 
that leaves us with a new desire, a new passion, a new nature that is in step with the Spirit of God, there should be evidence. And with that in mind, I think it's right and reasonable as a person who wants to do these things, who wants to see this kind of change in your life, to, to read this passage and look at these two lists and ask yourself, which of these lists describes me more? Which of these lists describes the things that I desire most? Which of these lists describes what I am pursuing most? Which desires and passions are ruling my life right now? Are you finding yourself often jealous or envious? Are you often tempted into sexual sin with your thoughts dominated by sensuality and impurity? Are you prone to drunkenness or drug abuse as an escape? Do you tend towards anger or rivalry or dissension? If so, be reminded this morning, if you are in Christ, those desires must die. You belong to Christ. Crucify your old desires with him and be raised into new life and get in step with the Spirit. Your desires are at odds. You have a divided nature. But one of these desires leads to dysfunction and destruction, and the other leads to beauty and health. Walking in step with the Spirit means that one of those natures has to die. Decreasing the opposition by coming into the unity of desire with the Spirit. You'll never be able to function in this three-legged race unless you get into step with a shared purpose, a shared desire with the Spirit of God. So turn to Christ and rely on the Spirit to change your desires, to give you a new nature, and to produce good and healthy fruit in your life. Let's pray together as we finish for today. God, it is hard for us to come to grips with the idea that we are at odds with you. God, we know that you love us, that you accept us, that you've made a way for us to be saved. But God, that does not mean that you want us to continue living in slavery to sin. No, God, you have called us to freedom in Christ. And God, that freedom means that you will graciously and mercifully stop us from doing the things that we want to do, the things that are destructive, the things that ultimately hurt us, the things that separate us from you. God, I pray this morning that you will stop us from doing those things. And God, instead, I pray that you will bring us in step with the Spirit. When we see these things rearing their ugly heads in our lives, when we see ourselves desiring all the things that Paul described that are wrong and dysfunctional and destructive, God, give us the clarity of mind to say, no, I see what my sinful flesh desires. And I want to crucify that along with Christ and instead follow after the Spirit of God. God, change us and help us to make choices each and every day so that we can be in step with your Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen.